I'd like to welcome you to this next session here at the Translator Centre. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank the sponsors, Amazon Crossing, for sponsoring the session while we're at it. My name is Lilith Thwaites. You'll probably have to switch your interpreting buttons to Australian English for this session. Um, my main role here is to present the session on practical opportunities for continuing education in translation. And the session is titled, Keeping Up with Changes in the Language, Industry and uh, Theory Behind Translation. I thought the last one was an interesting one. Um, the panel's task is to provide helpful hints for keeping skills fresh, learning more, exposing themselves to currently relevant writers, remaining engaged with updates to theory that can be useful for both professional translators and inspiring for aspiring translators. All sounds very grand. The fact that you're all here at the London Book Fair attending this and other sessions offered by this centre takes care of hint number one from me. Attend events such as book fairs and information sessions offered by experts in the field. That's why I'm here. And there's no question that the members of this panel are experts admirably suited to the task of providing further practical and helpful hints. So if we start at the far end, we have Peter Bush, who lives in Barcelona, though he's about to move back to Oxford. Um, his most recent translations from Catalan include The Grey Notebook by Giuseppe Pla, who's just, which has just come out, uh, and he might mention something about that. Um, and In Diamond Square by Mercero Loreda. And from Spanish, he's translated The Birthday Buyer by Adolfo Garcia Ortega and Sketches of Spain by Federico Garcia Lorca. He's a former director of the British Centre for Literary Translation and a professor of literary translation at the University of East Anglia. He was a consultant translator at the 2013 Banff Literary Translation School. Next to him is Richard Mansell, who's a senior lecturer in translation at the University of Exeter, where he directs the MA Translation and researches translators' decision-making processes and how texts are received in translation. So there'll be a few hints in that area, I'm sure. As well as extensive uh, work as a translator of institutional documents from Spanish and Catalan, he has translated work from Catalan poets such as Blay Bonet and Miguel Costa y Llobera, and collaborated on two successful translations and productions of Shakespeare into Catalan. Sitting next to him is Simon Bruni, who has been a general translator for 10 years and in recent years has started making the transition he hopes to becoming a fully-fledged literary translator. To do this, he undertook an MA in literary translation at the University of Exeter. There's a bit of an incestuous relationship here. Um, and since then, has translated two titles for Amazon Crossing. In 2011, he won a John Dryden Prize for his unpublished translation of slang-driven Spanish prison novel, Felda Dos Uno Uno. I think that they made a film of that, didn't they? Yeah. And it, the slang was just extraordinary. Um, and then sitting immediately to my right, Alistair Blythe, who was born in Sunderland, attended the universities of Cambridge and Durham. It's very modest, his blurb is very short, so he might have to expand on it. And now lives in Bucharest. He translates fiction, poetry, and philosophy by authors from the republics of Moldova and Romania. Those of you who attended yesterday's panels and the one this morning will probably already have picked up quite a few hints and suggestions in each of the categories that I listed, both from panel members and from the questions and answers that followed on from them, which often provide lots of other interesting comments. I'm confident that my fellow panelists are up to the challenge of adding to what those presenters had to say, and will be making many useful suggestions for you to think about and pursue. As I ask them various questions, um, they may well fill in their autobiography with relevant bits that seem applicable to, to what we're talking about. So perhaps I might kick off by asking each of you to talk briefly about the sorts of skills you think are critical for a translator to possess and how you keep those skills well and truly honed. Maybe Peter, if you want to start. Yeah, um, thank you, <coughs> Lilith. 
Well, um, I just want to read something from this translation that just came out on Tuesday by Giuseppe Pla. He wrote this work in 1918, 1919, and he was 21 and 22, and he was at Barcelona University, and he knew he wanted to be a writer. Um, but his parents insisted that he did a degree in law at Barcelona University, and he hated it. Um, uh, but he went to the Athenaeum, which was like a literary club, and he met writers and intellectuals there. And uh, this is a diary entry for the 21st of February, uh, 1919. Alexandra Planner advises me to become involved in proper literary activity. He suggests translating a really tough French book. He proposes Les Cornifleurs by Jules Renard. The title of Renard's novel plunges us into an endless discussion. What does it mean? Can one translate Les Cornifleurs, the sponger, by Altastoyetas, the dilettante? Of course, that isn't the quite the same thing. Translation is a div devilishly difficult occupation, but I see how useful it is, especially useful for getting to know one's own language. I would say that um, you know, continuing education as a translator, every new translation of a new writer that you do for a new publishing house is a piece of continuing education because you're, 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 you're thinking about how you're going to recreate a, 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 diff, a new individual uh, literary style. And then you're going to work with a new editor and you're not sure how that editor is going to edit, edit your translation. So you're, you're going to be in a new form of collaboration, perhaps with two or three editors even. Um, and I've been living in Barcelona for the last uh, 10 and a half years. And, and basically, I've, I've translated a lot of Catalan literature. And I would say in terms of continuing education, that, that has made me think really rethink my whole relationship with Hispanic and Iberian literature. Um, because there are kind of major writers in Catalan who haven't been translated, like, like Josette Pla, and they're not kind of part of the discussion of literature uh, in, the, in the Iberian word or in world literature or anything. Um, so for me, that, that's been a kind of massive adventure and a massive learning ex a learning exercise in terms of translating different writers writing in different with different uh, original styles in Catalan and you know Pla at the age of 21 he was discovering that that really what um, you have to uh, to be a literary translator however much Catalan you know or however much Chinese or Romanian the readers are going to read your English so the key thing is you know can you recreate different voices with, with each of the writers that you're translating. Yeah. Yeah. Richard. Um, thank you. Um, I suppose I'm here in part from the academic point of view, and I can see that later on we've got the word theory coming up, so we'll leave that until then. Um, it's just things to add to what Peter said, really. We always look at language skills from the point of view of a university. If someone's coming to a translation course, they have to know the language. But clearly, when we start talking to people about what's your language like, they always think that we mean the source language. Of course, the target language is a clear thing here. If you can't write in English, you can't write and you can't translate literature because that book will not be read as literature. It will depend for its existence and its literary quality on the source text. And the people don't want to read the source text. They want the translation. So that's a key issue. I also always ask my students, what do you read? And again, they think, what am I reading in the source language? Also, I'll always say, what are you reading in the target language? Not only do you have to locate this text that you want to translate, let's say from a point of view of a pitch, you have to locate it in the source literature. So you've got to know what's going on and what that tradition is. You've got to be able to say how it will fit in with... In, this sense British literature or wider English language literature and without that you will not be able to succeed as a literary translator uh, yeah really much along the same lines my evolution as a translator has been really evolving the end product the my writing in English and I took very practical steps towards making that happen after about five years of being a general translator working on non-literary texts um, not even books, just uh, websites, journalism, business procedures, um, all these sorts of things. Um, and what I decided to do was retrain almost um, and do the MA in Literary Translation at Exeter. And one thing I really worked on there was my writing in English and just sort of try and approach it with some humility really and pull apart what I'm doing and really look at the decision-making process 
um, the translation is a you, when you translate a text there's a series of thousands of decisions that you're making some of them unconscious some of them more conscious and doing the MA was really an opportunity to step back and actually consciously look at some of a lot of the stuff I was doing um, sort of unconsciously and um, also uh, have more time to work on a text um, you know in your your freelance jobbing translator you have a very tight deadline you, you you knock it out and that's it and you don't really look at it again you very rarely get feedback on your work because your clients generally uh, are not um, they don't have the skill set that's needed to assess your work um, they don't speak English in my case uh, or at least not well enough to really feedback on your work um, so that's um, a huge benefit of sort of retraining later in your career is that you, you, you okay you have a deadline for the pieces of work that you're doing but compared to real world translating it's it's huge and you've, so you've got lots of time to reflect on what you're doing and have it critiqued by someone like Richard um, and be able to discuss it in a group or discuss it with a tutor um, I found that process um, really helpful and I just found that the more humility I could find in myself um, it's not really a skill it's more a, a sort of approach the more humility I had the, the, the faster my writing developed because I was able to um, just be more supple and adapt more um, yeah <clears throat> Well, um, as a translator, I think it uh, goes without saying that you need to have an ear for the, the language as it is actually spoken, the raw material from which writers actually fashion their works. And um, like Peter, I've been living in the, the country where the language I translate from is, is actually spoken for, for 15 years. But obviously, this isn't a, a practical solution for every translator to, to move lock, stock and barrel to the, the country where you, uh, uh, you want to, where the language is spoken. But um, uh, in Romania, uh, the uh, Romanian Cultural Institute, for example, offers uh, scholarships for translators to, to come to the country and uh, meet writers and uh, uh, get the feel for the, the language in its uh, natural context so this would be a, uh, a solution for if you don't actually want to move to the, the country. Um, we've, had, we've had several people mention education, acad academic background, skill and training and um, as someone who actually spent a whole academic lifetime teaching Spanish literature and only after I retired being able to get finally to do what I really wanted to do which was literary translation there is some a question in my mind in a sense um, you know how important is it to actually what what do you get out of doing a degree in literary translation you're, look, you're looking at me <laughs> I, I think am, do I, I start am. this one first <laughs> um, I think just start with the degree first you get those analytical skills Yep. Because if we're talking about reading, then it's not just reading um, reading a book, putting it to one side, but it's starting to work out how that book works. And as a literary translator, you need to think of all of those networks of meaning that there are in a text. So then if you think of a degree in literary translation, it's taking it to that next level and making it more specific. Then what should be in that degree? Yes. That's something else that we can talk about, yes. and that's where that theory word might come up. Yeah. Um, but initially, it's the fact, particularly in the British system where it's a master's degree, and so somebody already has an undergraduate degree, and you're making it more specialist in the area of translation and literary translation, is trying to apply those analytical skills in that field. So that's the, that's the short answer. I okay. think I'll pass it I'll, on to Yeah, Peter. I'm just going to add in one more factor that people can think about as we go along. So if, for whatever reason, doing a degree in the area isn't an option, what are the sort of things that you can do for yourself outside that that will give you some of those skills that you might otherwise have picked up by doing a degree? Okay. Well, Simon mentioned... Um, sorry. Yep. I, no, no. I don't normally use a microphone. I normally just... 
belt it out at the, in a lecture theatre. Um, Simon mentioned being able to talk about translations in the classroom, in the, the translation workshops that we have. And so if you can just have a reading group, and so with the Emerging Translators Network, any other stories, those sort of groups who set up these reading groups for foreign literature, that would be a fantastic way of being able to... It's what would be called in the industry now CPD. But it's just talking about books with friends and then bringing things out of it, listening to other people, picking things out, taking a point of view that you hadn't thought of before. That sort of process is very useful, and that it's what we try to recreate and also recreate in a specific environment in, in university. But that, that's one of the main things that we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's some great opportunities to, to do that kind of thing really well and do it with preeminent translators in this country. For instance, two years ago, I did a summer school um, at uh, the Arvon Centre, which is in Ted Hughes's old house um, in a remote part of Yorkshire. Um, and so you're spending a week um, in, a, in more or less complete isolation with a group of translators and um, two um, wonderful preeminent tutors um, and you know th that sort of thing it, it's a week out of your life um, you, there's grants available for it if you can't fund yourself and if, if you can fund yourself you, you won't find them you know particularly expensive and um, I just found that an amazing experience that, an unforgettable experience from a point of view of enjoyment but also um, you know good opportunity to learn and and again have um, have uh, really really incredible experience translators look at your work and pick it apart and um, critique yourself and learn that way. Uh, Peter, if I can again just interrupt yeah. for a minute. I know that you've actually been on the other side. You're one of the experts that's been flown in or whatever yeah. to, to, to lead those sorts of workshops. What do you get out of that? Well, I was recently a consultant translator in Banff, and I recommend anybody who can to, to go to the Banff Literary Translation Centre. Um, it, it's for three weeks, and it's a kind of extended summer school, and they, they have a number of experienced translators who act as consultants. Uh, what do I get? Um, and, and basically, and then there are a group of 25 trans translators who are translating from all kinds of uh, d different languages. And basically, everybody in, you have your mornings free. So what did I get out of it? Um, you know, they feed you. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to think about that. Uh, you don't have to take your children to school. Uh, so as a, I, I as had a translator. I had three weeks in which I could yeah. devote my mornings to translating a book, uh, which was on a pretty urgent deadline. And then we met in the at, at, five, at four o'clock in the afternoon. We all met as a group, and there was a panel, and uh, two translators would present what they're translating. Uh, with, with one of the consultant translators. And you, I mean, you kind of learn a lot from the, from the discussions, which are coming from all kinds of different angles, different languages, different uh, research. I mean, another aspect of the kind of, uh, this kind of continuing education is the, the research tasks that each translation uh, kind of in, in, in involves. So, I mean, I would say, you know, the, the Banff is, is a very unique yeah. kind of uh, summer school. Um, I would also think that about the literary translation centers uh, across Europe um, and the writer centers in the States where you can get residences. And these are important because they give you time to, uh, to work on your translations, but you're also part of a community of writers and, and particularly of translators. And there, again, it's continuing education because they get, you're all talking about um, the issues of, in, in the current book that you're, tra that you're translating. Mm -hmm. Alistair, have you got anything more to add similar to the sorts of things you were saying that the government often offers? Yeah, well, um, as well as uh, uh, working with other translators, another uh, way is to, to work with the, the writers themselves. For example, uh, as I was saying, the Romanian Cultural Institute organises courses where translators can come and uh, meet writers, translate uh, from their work and discuss the the work with the writer, uh, him or herself. So this is the, the other end of the uh, the translation continuum, if you like, of the translator writer relationship and the translator publisher uh, relationship at the other end. Of Can we come back to that dreaded word theory that that I sat mulling over for some time? 
uh, you, you keep promising you'd come back to it. Do you want to come back to it now? <laughs> um, it, it, since we have a little bit here, then I'll, I'll take some of your words. It depends what we think theory is. There are probably some people here who've studied translation and my translation students will say, why am I reading this? Why am I reading that? And some bits of translation theory are very useful. Some bits aren't. Gideon Torrey and descriptive translation studies is not going to help you to improve as a translator. It's not directly applicable to the task that you've got. So what is theory? If we think of theory from a, almost a scientific point of view, it's trying to predict what can happen with translation. That's very useful for translation studies as an academic discipline. What we want to know as translators and learning translators is how to translate. What's going to be better? How can I even find a translation for this bit of source text that I have? How do I decide which translation that I've created is best here? So that's the sort of theory that's going to be useful and directly applicable in this context. Um, I, I did um, Richard's theory course at Exeter University and it was all incredibly interesting but in terms of what's actually genuinely useful is probably the last five minutes of the whole term <laughs> when, when Richard very elegantly arrives at um, a very simple um, theory of translation um, and um, you know, with the idea that the simpler a theory is the more efficient it is, the better it is, and, and that's what he arrives at at the end. And so you go through this whole process of reading, reading crazy French philosophers and um, you know, some really difficult to read texts, um, but actually what you arrive at at the end is uh, two circles on the board with a couple of words written in them. Uh, I don't know if you want to explain that. What if, that I is. Tell, if I tell people at the start, then they might just leave. <laughs> um, it's basically making, if you, if you want to think of theory from a the point of view of a translator, you've got to get out of it what's useful for you. We always get our students, and it's a pretty typical thing in translation courses across the country and across the globe, to write a commentary with their translation so that they can reflect on it. And we liken that to any sort of learning process. When you start learning to drive, for example, it's levers and bits everywhere, and you think, how am I ever going to be able to turn the corner and change gear at the same time? This is impossible. By thinking about things initially and externally, then you start to make those processes internal, and suddenly things start to click, and you don't have to think deliberately about everything at once. So we'll get people to think in translation about the meaning of single words, even how you can break a word down, how that word will link to other words itself as well. Then thinking about syntax with it. If you're thinking about translating poetry, devices such as meter, rhyme and so on, you can't think of all of that at once at the start. You've got to break it down. And being able to think about that and comment on that and talk about that with people, with written commentary or spoken commentary, that's going to be the useful sort of theory, really. For the sake of uh, Peter's future career, uh, not Peter, sorry, Richard's future career, anyone who's recording this, please delete the start of the, of the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Peter. Um, I, I kind of set up a degree, MA degree, at Middlesex University in the 1980s, which was called the Theory and Practice of Translation. And uh, the focus was on the, the, the kind of projects which got bigger during the, during the year of translation, translations that the students did. And the idea was that as it was in London, the Middlesex, uh, to get professional literary translators to work as editors with the students on, 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 on these projects. Because I think that, you know, that that kind of interaction between the professional literary translator who's experienced with, I mean, it's, in a way, it was like mentoring but within an MA uh, framework. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I also organised courses and um, conferences in the 1990s on on translation, in which there was a lot of theoretical discussion. My 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 feeling is that um, a lot of translation theory is, is, as you said, is kind of really not relevant to literary translators, and uh, really literary translation is a form of instant in literary interpretation, literary criticism. So that, you know, why, why the obsession with translation theory? I think that if you read uh, works of uh, interpretation of literature, um, that is equally valuable as, as, as a literary translator because what you, what you need to do, is to, as you were saying, you know, kind of interpret the resonances that are, that are within the, the words to interpret the narrative movement of, I mean, I mainly translate novels, you know, the different narrative movements within, within the books that you're, you're, you're translating. 
all of that is a question of interpretation. And, and every kind of micro decision is an interpretive move right from the first draft. Um, and you're refining that interpretation in terms of your writing of the translation throughout the drafting process and throughout your interactions with, the, uh, with, with, with editors. So I think that that is, um, um, I, to me, I mean, I, I, I feel that the kind of parallel, for, for literary translators, you know, creative writing, the, the, the kind of sort of stuff that, cre that, are, that are done in, uh, in creative writing uh, MAs here or M MFA programs in the US are extremely valuable because that, that's all about honing yourself as a writer. Um, and I think if I might just add that, that, yeah. that for those of us whose careers have been in the study of a particular literature, in my case it was Spain, um, just learning as a student how to decipher, untangle whatever it was that you were reading, again, in my case, it's more prose than anything else that I'm interested in, trying to find those narrative voices so that you can then trans transfer, transmit, interpret those voices um, when you're doing your own translation. So I'm sort of heartened by the fact that maybe what you're suggesting is that you don't actually have to do that degree in translation. <laughs> so I don't have to go back to school. Um, but that, that a lot of the things, I mean, in a sense, You've got those skills no matter what it is that you've studied. It's a question of finding out how those skills apply specifically to what you're now doing. Can I just add it probably isn't the best marketing tool in the world, but I always tell my students, particularly my undergrads, when they say, I want to be a translator, do I have to do an MA? And I always say, no. What you will get is a certain training. You may get certain skills more quickly, more directed, but certain people will respond better to a taught program. Certain people might not get what they want out of it, but you do not have to study a master's to become a translator. Quick question. How much, how much of the practical, and this is another thing that I wanted to get to, the, the sort of, you know, here's how you meet the agents, here's how important it is to do the following things. How much of that is incorporated into those sorts of degrees? And in, for our course, that's something that we've included in about the past three years. And so it's, it becomes part of the modules that people do in the second term. And for literary translation, that's with literary translation itself and also for retranslation. So when you've got to compare your translation to another existing one, so be able to pitch that new approach to it. That's, it's not universal, I know that much, mm. but it's something that we've definitely wanted to get in. Perhaps if other people could comment sp specifically on those practical aspects, which are often, I think, the hardest things. You've got your translation and, and sort of, and now what? Where do I go? Who, who do I approach? Or have I left it too late? Should I have done that first? And all those sorts of things. Um, well, there's a huge number of us sort of early career translators who have just come together um, under the Emerging Translators Network. It's probably been mentioned God knows how many times on these panels. Um, but um, it, it's evolved and it's just become a real great support and information sharing network. Um, and it does shed a lot of light to people who are early career on a world which is very mysterious when you first discover it and which after sort of several years of trying to inhabit it, I'm still, uh, haven't, don't feel I've cracked. Um, you know, learning the kind of language of the publishing industry and learning what, what they want to hear if you've got a good idea. Um, but, you know, talk to other translators at the same kind of um, stage in their career as you, but you can also just approach um, more experienced translators. I've always found them um, really willing to help, um, almost kind of with a, a political desire to help younger translators. And, um, you know, yesterday I was just chatting to Maureen Freely and we were just chatting about random stuff, I don't know, Turkish politics or something. And uh, I just thought, well, she doesn't seem too busy. Uh, maybe I'll show her a pitch that I have put together. And she was very receptive, and she gave me some great ideas. Um, and she sent me an email this morning saying, sorry, I, did, I didn't have time. I had to rush off. If you're around today, I'll, uh, I'll try and give you a bit more advice. So, it's, you know, it's, you, um, I constantly come across this kind of generosity from more experienced translators, and uh, it's definitely worth um, And, yeah. Well, uh, living in Romania, my relationship is mainly with the publish Romanian publishers and the Romanian writers, and I uh, very rarely have an opportunity to meet with uh, translators from other languages into English, and so this is uh, 
one such opportunity now. But can I um, add a, a, a kind of different note, really, uh, to theory, which is a motivation for continuing education, which is cash flow. Uh, cash flow, if you, you know, if you want, I'm, I've been a full-time literary translator, sort of having left um, the, the BCLT 11 years ago. Um, you know, how do you pay the, the bills at the end of every month um, as a literary translator? And, and, and I have a very kind of uh, open mind in terms of what I translate. I don't think I've ever translated anything I hated. But I translate a wide range of books. I mean, I translate high literature. I translated a book, you, you may not have heard of him, by an ultra trail runner called Killian Jornet, uh, who's the like a mountain goat going across mountain peaks. And I learned a lot about thigh muscles, which I never knew I had, or I probably don't have anyway, but because uh, <laughs> I'm not an ultra trail runner. But um, I, I did... Uh, Severiano Ballesteros' autobiography, The Golfer. Um, I've done, you know, books of political science. Uh, I always do things that I think I can, I can manage uh, with my, with, you know, that they're not going to take me too much time in terms of uh, research and that I, I can handle that different kind of register and, and language. But, you know, if you're not going to be able to kind of really uh, establish yourself as a literary translator, as a, if you want to be a full-time literary translator, which is very difficult, without having that, you know, kind of broad range. And, you know, I, I also think that this helps you as a literary translator because, on the whole, writers, even writers who write this difficult modernist stuff, they've read all, you know, they, they read all kinds of things. They read, you know, they also read the back, you know, the... Uh, uh, kind of, they read when they were kids, they read serial fiction, they read comics, and all that comes into their, their stream of consciousness. And you kind of need that openness to, the, to, to kind of all kinds of language that's out there, in print or online or wherever. I mean, soaking up what's there in a, in a critical way, but I mean, soaking up also kind of unconsciously. It kind of come, can come when you're in the middle of looking for a word or whatever, you know, all of that experience helps. Um, and it's driven by ca cash, flow cash flow issues. Um, uh, I'd like to add to that that um, the hardest uh, translations, are, uh, the hardest to translate is something that's badly written, but this is, usually isn't the case with uh, literary translations, but uh, working as a translator, I also uh, translate, for example, architectural text in which the the writer isn't a writer but uh, is trying to sound as if he is a writer and comes out with all kinds of you know, guff and uses words without really knowing what they mean and so this is the hardest kind of thing to translate in a literary translation no matter how uh, modernist or complex it, it's uh, it's easier to translate something like that than a, a a text which has been, you know, written by an amateur, as it were. I'm sorry, but I have to say I've translated some rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> but I better not say what it is. <laughs> we're, being, we're being watched. And learnt something from it? <laughs> not no. to accept anymore. <laughs> um, well, what I'm doing and um, how I funded my MA was through doing general commercial translation. Um, aside from the fact it can help pay the bills, um, you know, you, you translate, you can translate such a vast, uh, bizarre array of texts when you're a commercial translator. Uh, the other thing I did, uh, the other day I did a text about baby poo. I've done a, a instruction manual for a pneumatic shoe making machine. <laughs> um, websites, journalism, uh, business documents, you know, it's just uh, all, all these texts, they might not be high literature, but they all have their own voice and they all have different voices. And you can bring that kind of um, malleability that you develop into literary translation. So it becomes not only a source of income, but also a kind of apprenticeship for literary translation and a kind of bit of training, really, for, for literary translation. I think it's, it's important to, to highlight, really, what we've been saying, that most literary translators do something else as well. Whether it's that you do something else at the start when you're trying to lead into it, which can be the way with getting into freelance translation anyway, or while you are translating so whether it's that you're an academic who translates whether it's that you're a translator of non-literary documents who moves into literary documents as well whether it's that you do something completely different but then at night don't sleep and just translate literature all of these are quite standard career paths and the problem
problem is that we don't have a standard career path. Um, I'm very conscious that the clock's ticking and that there will be questions. So just a couple of things coming from, from so far away, the opportunities to attend all these wonderful face-to-face -face things that you're talking about are not really uh, feasible. So I'm just wondering if, if maybe you, you had something to say about, okay, so if you can't do the physical, what about the virtual? What is there out there virtually? You mentioned the, the network of emerging translators. What other sorts of things are there that you might be able to access that would be helpful? Um, well, the, a great tool is having friends that are native speakers in your source language, and I'm often on Skype talking to Spanish friends, going to them with some, well, what appear to them incredibly strange, strange. questions. <laughs> Um, sometimes the answer I receive is not the one I expect, but yeah. Yes, I had one which was, tell me about the, the local drug scene in Madrid for young people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we've got to be lucky we are with the internet as well, because I remember when I was learning Spanish, I'd be about 14. I used to love going to see, um, clearly I'm not from the south of this country. I'd love going to see my grandma and granddad in Winchester because the WH Smith there had yesterday's Spanish El País newspaper. And that was my way of getting hold of something. Now, of course, we all know about newspapers, radios and so on that we can get through the internet. But of course, reading, you can download books easily. We, even though we're being sponsored, I'm not going to mention the K word. But you can even get samples of novels that you can download as well as web sites where you can get short stories, poetry and so on. So there's an easier way into reading some material and being able to follow things. Reading things such as the literary supplement for the particular newspapers that you like, so Babelia for El País is a fantastic one to read each week. I think um, when I'm sort of feeling bored and want, being, want to do something entertaining, I, you know, there are, these, there are so many blogs and literary sites and, I, and there are so many that you can't possibly kind of look at them all the time. But I, you know, would just kind of, there's one called Book, Book Slut. I don't know if you know that one. It's a very, very good, despite what you might think about the title, the, the name of it. It's an excellent kind of literary uh, site and, and good discussions, interesting reviews, interviews, and so on. There's the complete review. Um, so I kind of, you know, every, every week I'll kind of look at a new website, a new literary website. Um, there's Asymptote, which has been mentioned several times, but the, there are kind of lots out there. And the, the, there's such a, a high, a kind of sophisticated level of discussion of translations on some of these web, on some of these blogs and websites that you kind of never find in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the print. In print. And so I think it's really worth um, exploring the, 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 those kind of literary, literary, literary websites online. And that's obviously something that you can do wherever you are in the world. Yeah. Sounds as if everybody would sort of list the internet as one of their indispensable tools. Yeah. Other things like that that you might pass on? Other indispensable tools, online dictionaries or whatever? Mm, I'm not quite sure for literary translation, it must be said. There's some fantastic things that you end up finding. So the Real Academia have all of their past dictionaries online. So if you're translating something, whether it's bizarre archaic terms in there or a genuinely old text, then that can really help. For Catalan, the Dictionarica de la Valencia Balea is all online, so you don't need to have the 10 or 12 volume massive edition that you, that you would normally have before. And when I was learning Catalan, that's what I had to consult. That wasn't yes. online. And so it, it's finding the tools for your language. And so then finding an expert in the language helps. So it goes back to meeting people, speaking to people. And people generally are quite nice. Yes. Don't, if, if you look at non-literary texts and look at sites, oh, we're going to be video, this is bad. Sites such as prose and look at the forums, people generally aren't very nice. Yes. But when you meet actual translators in the flesh, normally they're very nice people. I think, I mean, like I was... You mentioned this Pla. I mean, I'd never read Pla before I started translating him. And uh, there are scholars, you know, I mean, universities are full of scholars who have devoted years to writing books about some of the writers that you're translating. And they're, you know, they're kind of pleased to, to kind of discuss with you or answer questions or you can meet up with them and uh, you can read their books. And I think that, you know, that kind of, you know, drawing on the scholarship that kind of exists around the books that you're translating. I mean, it's, I mean it, kind of, it seems obvious, but you, 
you might feel hesitant about, translate, uh, about approaching a university professor you've never met before. But, you know, I mean, a, um, I think that I, I've never found a university professor or e e even, you know, kind of independent scholars who have devoted years to, to, to us, who are not interested in meeting somebody who's actually going to bring yes. what they're interested in into in, a, a much broader international audience. Yep. Yeah. I think this brings it back to the point of what a university education and what universities can offer literary translation. You, you don't have to do a master's to be a translator or a literary translator, but a university department is a fantastic place and it's about a lot more than dry translation theory. In our department, we've got people covering five main language areas. Then within Spanish, we've got Catalan and Portuguese as well. And all of these people have interests in the areas. They love talking about the areas that they know. Some people have spent 30 years on a particular author. If you go to them and say, could you tell me a bit about this? It won't be a bit. It'll be a lot. But it'll be a useful lot yeah. that you can have. And then it's someone who can guide you through this massive material. We've mentioned the internet. There's no way that we can read everything that's on the internet, no, as you said, no. with all of the blogs. You need to have some sort of guidance there, and that's what the, the university can offer in that regard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, sometimes there are things that not even the internet or the, the best uh, dictionary can help you with. For example, uh, once I was translating a text in which uh, uh, the expression apa neon chaputa uh, came up which means unbegun water literally so I asked people I knew in Bucharest what what's this unbegun water no idea they couldn't find it in any dictionary and so I telephoned somebody I knew in the in a village in the Carpathians what's apa neon chaputa I don't know but uh, at the time, he happened to be uh, chopping wood for this uh, old woman in her 80s. So he asked her, and she said, oh, well, this is uh, when you're making a, a folk remedy. You have to go and find this water from some source where no animal or person has ever has drunk that uh, morning. And so this is what unbegun water is. But so, uh, as I say, not the Internet isn't... Uh, <laughs> the solution to everything sometimes you have to uh, okay. ask uh, somebody <laughs> from the village yeah. find, find those old grannies out there yes <laughs> <laughs> okay um, but we might open it up to questions now and that'll probably raise a few more issues so um, there is a, I think a microphone so if you have questions and if you are directing them generally that's fine or if you're a particular person just let us know who um, here. yep over here yep uh, it's more a comment rather than a question. I really like the fact that you mentioned literary theory because I think that's maybe what helped me the most, first of all. And then after that, translation theory also helped me uh, more to maybe support what I'm doing, so to argue it. So when people ask me, why did you do this? I now have a very good support system where I can say, well, according to so-and-so, this is okay. You know, so I think that kind of helped to feel more confident as a translator theory uh, could help. And another one last thing that really has been helping me too is is reading translations from my source language into English, which is my target language, to see some of the problems that how they solve problems. Mm -hmm. So then I can apply that to my own translation to go, oh, okay, th so this is how it can also be translated. Mm -hmm. So more common. Mm -hmm. Is this worth? Yeah. I'll just add to that. We haven't mentioned the word linguistics yet. And, um, you know, I think in, in sometimes it's uh, maybe undervalued in translation studies. Uh, but my background was very much in linguistics, and I'm, I, I'm certain I would have benefited, benefited massively from studying literature more than I did, but I did find um, linguistics doing semantics and syntax and historical linguistics as well, and all those things, phonetics even. Um, you know, I found this all coming back to me when I was um, doing Richard's MA, because um, you have a fairly linguistics-y background as well, don't you, Richard? So, um, yeah. seems to confirm what my uh, instinct told me. I had um, my, my training is a degree in French Lit with linguistics. And all I heard confirms that that was as good a grounding. So I would have said a degree in your own language might be the best mm. way forward. Mm. Um, 
The other thing I would say is I have found translators wonderfully helpful at every level, at the level of problem with a word, at the level of any sort of theory. So uh, I think they, they are a fantastic source. And my last point would be uh, when you seek help without is being aware at one end of what you don't know and being able to ask the right questions. And also what you know and being able to stand your ground. Yes, yeah. Which is often, I think, important when you're at that copy edit stage where you are absolutely convinced that what you had is what it should be, but you've got to be able to explain, defend to the copy editor or whoever why it's got to be that way and not the way they've suggested. Sometimes you end up getting a rather mean translator revising your text, more in non-literary translation. And that's where standing your ground is a good thing. They're just trying to show you up because they don't want you to get the job from the agency next time. <laughs> oh, we've been recorded again, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> it does happen. Question back there. Um, yeah, it was more like a comment, really. I just wanted to mention um, forums. We, I translate from Arabic, and we just recently sort of finally managed to have a really functioning um, private Facebook group amongst translators going both ways. And at the moment, it's actually really lively and really useful. And so I don't know if uh, maybe you want to comment about your uh, languages, because I know that in Spanish and French that I don't that I speak but don't really translate from. There's some really good stuff on the word reference forums and mm. perhaps you've got, you've probably got much more developed resources, I don't know. But with Arabic, it's quite new. And also, if anyone wants access to that, they can see me. But um, yeah, I thought that would be a good thing to flag up. Mm -hmm. Any comments there? Yes, over here. Um, I wanted to make a, co a question and sort of a comment about the unbegun waters you, that you were talking about. I translate from Urdu into English, and like Arabic and Urdu, these are languages where you have very rich, beautiful proverbs and idioms which cannot be translated literally into English. Yeah. But we always find ourselves in this debate um, whether proverbs should be translated literally because they enrich the language or whether they should be conveyed in other words. Just recently, I, I came over... I, uh, I came across a proverb in Urdu which stated Dil ko zang lag jana, which literally means when the heart becomes so corrupted and loses its feeling, it as if accumulates rust upon it, so a rusted heart. So something like that, would you introduce to English or convey it in other words? Where do you draw the line? Well, I, I think I'd uh, convey it in the, the terms in which it was expressed in, in the original language because uh, this is the... Uh, the metaphor is uh, drawn from the, uh, uh, you know, you lose the metaphor otherwise. Um, uh, this actually takes me back to the last five minutes of Richard's theory course. Um, they were obviously very important five minutes. Yeah, they were. <laughs> Blink and you miss it. <laughs> um, sometimes the target text and the locale, as Richard has chosen to call it um, of the target text um, also is a strong force you know and making that decision of whether you would um, try let something of the original come through or or make it fit more snugly into the target culture it depends what your aim is doesn't it because if you translate a proverb a set phrase literally then unless it just happens to exist in a target language which then is complete luck then you're turning it into new metaphor, and people might not accept that. And so then they'll, they might see it as a translator's mistake. So you've got to be very careful with what you're doing. So it, it all depends on the overall aim. That said, in translation, you can get some things in that you couldn't otherwise. Borges has this fantastic quote where he said, sometimes I'd think of a wonderful metaphor that people would just not accept because it was so different. So I'd attribute it to some 8th century Norseman, and then people think it's great. I, I translated a, <coughs> a Renaissance narrative, uh, kind of really an embryonic novel, the, the Thalestina, where there's this wonderful kind of uh, board who uh, kind of talks and talks and talks, and all her conversations are larded with, uh, with proverbs. And I, I sometimes used what was there in the, in, the, in the Spanish proverb. There was sometimes it was a direct equivalent in English, and sometimes I invented uh, proverbs that don't exist in English. 
Um, you know, it, it, it depends on the kind of energy of the text and the kind of characterization, you know, the character that you're, you're kind of recreating. And it's got to be kind of lively. I don't think there's any kind of one formula for translating proverbs or metaphors or images, really. Um, I guess then, if you can make it sound like a proverb, yeah, you're convincing them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you can get away yeah, with that's it. That's right. <laughs> Looks yeah. like it could work. And you know, it's Renaissance, so how are people not to know that that might, might not have mm. been a Renaissance English proverb, you know? Hello. Um, Peter mentioned the Banff Centre as a very helpful space um, mm. for him to translate in. And I wondered if um, you could all um, maybe mention something that you've participated in, whether it's a residency or a workshop or a class or what have you, that you found um, most helpful for your practice or just for thinking about your practice. Wants to get the ball rolling. Um, I'll start then. So you've no, mentioned it already. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, I translated two Shakespeare's for the stage in the Balearic Islands with an author, Biel Mesquida, um, from well, born in Valencia but then moved to Mallorca very early age. Says so Mallorcan author, and together with the company as well. And so then you had the three sides: an author who knows they're the target language but doesn't know the source language of Shakespeare's English. I knew the English and could write in Catalan because um, it was part with the university out there in Mallorca. And then you've got the side of the people saying what can and cannot work on the stage itself as well. So that negotiation between the different agents that you have was one of the most useful things. So you get used to thinking of things from someone else's point of view, not straight from a point of view of this has to be literally correct or I can only think of a source text. There not only is the target text important, but also where it's going to be used as well. Um, hanging out with translators, it's just, it's a great, great method, yeah. Yes, well, I, I agree with this. <laughs> or hanging out with writers. Or, yeah. Yes, yes. And I think probably for, for me, one of the things that sticks in my mind, partly just to convince myself that, that, that I could do it, was um, helping out someone who was running a master class um, with a writer actually there. And it was just, it was post-grad students and a friend of mine who was running it and said, why don't you come along? And, um, and actually seeing that, okay, yes, you know, uh, collaboration, talking with other people, but, but that need to build up your own sense that, yes, I can do it too, sort of thing. Um, some, just another thing that's helpful for me, nothing nobody's mentioned yet, is Twitter. Because there's practically every translator in the world is on Twitter. And loads of authors and publishers and book people and reviewers and just really interesting people with everything to do with literature, translation, commercial translation, literary translation. and. Even though you can't get very much into 140 characters, there's links to <laughs> um, sites, blogs, everything that's already been mentioned. It's a good, wonderful resource. Yeah, it, it, it's easy to. Does this work? Yeah, it's easy to find people now. So mm. it's easy for an author to find you. Maybe they're you know looking for a translator or they want some advice or something, and it's easy for you to find authors or other translators. You you know you can. There's so many ways on the internet to find people, which is great. The problem with social media can be keeping it under control, though, can't it? That yes. Sometimes, yes, Twitter is very good for answering questions, but then remember that you are a translator, not a professional tweeter, yes. twitterer, whatever the word is. I don't know. Don't do Twitter. Okay, we have time for just one more. Well, it's not a question. It's a, a reply to that earlier one, which is um, if you can get yourself on the... British Centre for Literary Translations mentorship program that is t really invaluable. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Okay, thank you to all of you. And just one other comment that will, I'm sure interests you all. Amazon Crossing, who have the table on the back left-hand corner, have some free copies of books to give away. So by all means, go and help. Uh, well, don't help yourselves. Just accept the handouts, I guess. <laughs> thank you very much.